When an individual reaches the teenage years, they really start to ask questions about who they want to be when they grow older, who they want to associate with, who they want to work for, potentially. So what we're talking about here is stage five of Eric Erickson's developmental theory, that identity versus role confusion. So what the teen is basically doing is balancing between trying to figure out who they want to be right now and all the different possibilities of who they could be in the future. Now, Piaget talked about the stage as well. This is that formal operational stage. And the way he described it was that these teens basically fantasize about how their life could turn out. They do, they, they imagine themselves playing various roles. They do like trial runs, you know, they, they use their capability to think about the future and think about abstract ideas and hypotheticals to try to figure out what might happen if they take different paths in life. Um, there's a strong focus when they do this on uh, career roles, like jobs they might want to get someday. But we also see a focus on things like talents they might want to develop, romantic pursuits that they might want to pursue, uh, various kinds of friendships they might want to build, uh, religious beliefs that they begin to develop, and so on. So they're trying to develop all different aspects of their personal identity. And a lot of research has been done on how they go through this process. Here's uh, some research from Marcia. So Marcia identified these four statuses, these four identity statuses that teens will go through, though they don't necessarily always go in the following order. Th this is a common order we see, but they don't always go in this exact order. So when an individual reaches the teenage years, they're in the state of diffusion where they're kind of overwhelmed by the task of achieving an identity and they don't really know what to do. They, they do relatively little to try to accomplish that task. Eventually that will transition into foreclosure where that individual has their status determined by an adult, like a parent, for example, rather than by personal exploration. And this can provide some relief to the teen because at least now they have some direction in life. Uh, stage three is usually moratorium, where the individual is now examining different alternatives, but they haven't found one yet that's uh, satisfactory. And then the fourth and final status that teens will go through is achievement, where the individual has explored multiple alternatives and has deliberately chosen one to be part of their identity. But like I said, it doesn't always go in that exact order. That's just the common order we tend to see. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to teens and how they think about the world and how they uh, make sense of themselves as well, there, there is this really strong focus on themselves. And that should make a lot of sense. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out who they are. They're thinking about the future. They're spending pretty much 100% of their time just trying to make these really important decisions. So uh, that's perfectly reasonable. But the unfortunate consequence is that kind of makes them seem, you know, selfish. It makes them seem egotistical. And they are. They literally are egotistical. That's one important characteristic of adolescent thought. This adolescent egocentrism, where they're overly concerned with their own thoughts and feelings, and they just literally don't have time or energy to be concerned about other people. You know, this is completely different from childhood egocentrism. Childhood egocentrism occurs because the child doesn't know how to care about others. They, they lack that empathy. Teens have empathy. Teens can understand others. They just don't have time for that. So, and, or energy. So this is why they tend to come off like that. It's just they're spending all their time and energy trying to figure out themselves. They don't have time for anybody else.
Uh, another characteristic of adolescent thought is this imaginary audience, where on some level, maybe not consciously, but on some level, the adolescent believes that others are always watching them and judging them, even if they're alone. It's like they feel that peer pressure so strongly that it follows them everywhere they go. Uh, the next one is a uh, personal fable, where the adolescent believes that their experiences and feelings are unique, despite clear evidence that they aren't. Now, in the previous video, I talked about the uh, developmental difference between the limbic system and the frontal lobe. Remember, the limbic system, that has to do with how, you know, the limbic system is fully developed by the time you reach teenage years, and this, this relates to how strongly you can feel those adult emotions, like desire and so on. So teens are feeling the full adult emotions for the first time. And this is why it seems unique to them. They, they've never had these kind of feelings before. So they think because it feels unique to them, because it's new to them, they externalize that and think it's just unique in general. Like nobody has ever felt this kind of love for someone else before. But, you know, if you actually spend a little time and you think about it, it doesn't make much sense. But, you know, the other part of that is the frontal lobe in teens is not fully developed, so they can't really rationalize it that way very well. They have to get a bit older before they really start to understand that. And then the fourth characteristic is this illusion of invulnerability. And that just comes right back to the functional or the developmental difference between the frontal lobe and the limbic system. So the adolescent has a well enough frontal lobe, well enough developed frontal lobe to understand that misfortune does happen, but they just can't understand that it might happen to them. They can't imagine it happening to themselves. And as I already said about the other ones, you know, when the teen gets a little bit older and their frontal lobe finishes developing around the age of 25, that's when they tend to outgrow this kind of thinking. <clears throat> now, all of these different aspects of the adolescent thought process are related to a concept from philosophy, in fact. Uh, it's called solipsistic thought. Solipsistic thought is this belief that the self is like the center of reality. It's the focus of reality and everyone and everything else only exists because of that center. It's like other people exist for you to experience them. And parents and rooms and even like physical things, they are only there to serve a purpose for you. It's like you're the center of the universe. If you've ever talked to a teen before, they oftentimes do come off sounding like the center of their own little universe. And that's called solipsistic thought. Now, in this pursuit for identity, for many teens, figuring out what their ethnic identity is, is a big part of that. So ethnic identity refers to this feeling that you belong to a specific ethnic group. And about one third of adolescents and young adults do belong to an ethnic minority, and those are the ones that are likely to develop this kind of aspect to their personal identity. And ethnic identity develops in three phases. So typically, earlier in childhood, uh, the individual's ethnic roots don't seem important to them. In fact, they might go against it. Uh, children of minority groups, they often will fight against it because they see that as like a barrier in a sense. Like they, they want to be a part of the group. They want to assimilate. They want to be cohesive with all their friends. So they don't really want to think that there's something separating them just yet. But when they get closer to the teenage years, that's when they'll start to explore their ethnic heritage and start to learn more about their uh, history and learning traditions and things like that. And then over time, they'll incorporate that into themselves and connect with their past, connect with their own heritage, and that will become an important part of their identity. <clears throat> so uh, these, these things are all very important when it comes to identity, but there's one other aspect in particular that plays a major role for all teenagers, and it generally develops in the same pattern across 
various teenagers. And that's how self-esteem changes. So when you look at young kids, typically like preschoolers, you generally see that these individuals have a very high self-esteem. And that should make sense. You know, they, they don't really know too much yet. They haven't really faced much adversity yet. And they probably get their parents telling them, you know, wonderful things all the time. So they have a overblown self-esteem typically in preschool. But as they spend more time around others, as they compare themselves and their lifestyle to other like children of the same age, over time, that will reduce their self-esteem. So it's through those social comparisons with their peers that their self-esteem will begin to decrease. And by the time the child reaches uh, like high school, their self-esteem has gotten to a very, very low state. That's about as low as it tends to get. And this is around the same time that children have to adapt to this new, you know, maturing, you know, like young adult almost environment and create a new kind of pecking order. And when they figure out what their place is in this new adultish society, then that will start to, you know, increase their self-esteem. So their self-esteem will start to go back up once they've found a spot for themselves in society. <clears throat> and self-esteem and self-worth, uh, these things actually have a lot to do with ethnic identity and being in a minority. Minorities, in fact, see huge increases in self-esteem once they gain that ethnic identity I was describing a moment ago. <clears throat> now, like I said, it's through these peer comparisons that self-esteem will begin to decline and then it goes back up once you find a spot in society. But there are other factors that play a big role when it comes to what degree of self-esteem a teenager will have. So, for example, adolescents will have a higher self-esteem if they believe that they're skilled in some domain that they value. So if they believe that they're a good artist or a good musician or a good student, you know, what, whatever it is they value, if they think they're good at it, then that's going to make them feel pretty positive about themselves. Another thing is if they believe that their peers think highly of them. Uh, another one is if they feel their parents are being affectionate and involved in their lives. Uh, you don't want to be too involved. You don't want to be too affectionate because that can actually kind of backfire. And also if they believe their parents have set reasonable expectations for them and are willing to be democratic when it comes to enforcing rules and determining what the rules should be. So the key here for all of these is what the teen's perception is. They have to have these kind of positive perceptions of their lives for it to have a positive effect on their self-esteem. Now, just to wrap up this whole discussion, when it comes to the teen years and, you know, when self-esteem is at its lowest and they're adjusting to this kind of pecking order I was describing, a lot, a lot of people would call that, you know, one of the worst times of their life. You know, they, they, it's, it's pretty unpleasant situation for most individuals. We tend to refer to this as the myth of storm and stress. <clears throat> and while it can be pretty you know, traumatic for some individuals, it can be pretty distressing for most, the research on this particular time period shows that most adolescents, while they do have problems, they also do feel loved by their parents. They feel appreciated. They feel wanted by their parents. So even though they might have some difficulties, they do feel like they have a place in the world. They have people who care about them. And more, more than that, they also value their parents' input and guidance. They will seek out their parents for help and they'll actually embrace their parents' values long after they've moved out of the home. <clears throat> Not all teens have such a great relationship with their parents and their family, of course, and about 25% of those conflicts that we do see can exacerbate the problem. It can push the teen down a more dark path, leading to some serious behavior problems, but that's, that's not at all the norm. That's, that's, that's one of the more rare cases. <clears throat> and generally, we only see that kind of thing if the teens have trouble 
with regulating their emotions. If they have some kind of emotional disorder or they've suffered from some kind of recent trauma or something like that.